Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to today's webinar, The Race to End the Pandemic, Ensuring Global Vaccine Equity. Thank you so much for joining us today for this really special webinar. Uh, before we begin, let me first just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Paul Brangan. I am Director of Communications and External Affairs at the Pacific Asia Travel Association, and I will be your host for today. Now we have, uh, we have some great speakers with us from UNICEF, but before we get to that, I do have a couple of quick te technical notes to share with all of you this today. So many of you are familiar with Zoom, but just to refresh yourself, uh, you'll notice at the, bo the bottom of your browser, there is a chat function and a Q&A function. Please use the chat function to engage with other participants. Uh, you can say hello, where you're from, um, what you're doing. Feel free to comment on the presentations. However, please do not submit any questions to the speakers using this function. Uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, you can submit them using the Q&A function. As I said, uh, if you put any questions in the chat, it's tough for me to moderate both the chat function and the Q&A at the same time. So please do submit your questions using the Q&A function. And just a reminder for the chat, please do keep it cordial and professional uh, uh, in your communications. Uh, I'm gonna quickly go through the agenda. Uh, so uh, after this, we'll hear from Pata CEO, Liz Ortegera regarding Pata's eight point industry recovery plan. And then we'll also hear from World Bank's vaccine initiative. And we'll hear from John Peratot at Glo uh, Global Tourism Specialist at the World Bank. And then of course, we'll move to our guest speakers from UNICEF, uh, Liz Case, the Senior Private Sector Partnerships for Act A COVAX Focal Point, Shweta Dahia, Partnerships Manager, Act A slash COVAX, and Rahul Bansal, Corporate Partnerships Lead at UNICEF India. And with that, I'd like to move right along. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen please welcome for the opening remarks, Pata CEO, Ms. Liz Ortegera. Liz? Greetings to all our valued members on the call today, and thank you for taking time out of your busy days to join us for this important message. Um, before I turn it over to our esteemed guests from UNICEF, I'd like to share with you um, our eight-point plan for supporting our members and the industry recovery. Um, many of you would have received the, um, the members-only newsletter that I sent out last week that uh, summarizes some of these initiatives. Next page. Thank you. So on this page, you'll see um, some of the, the, the list of eight strategies that we're taking to address both the urgent needs and the strategic needs. You know, as, you, as we've all felt, um, this, this pandemic has been more long running and more vast than any of us could have imagined 18 months ago, 20 months ago when it started. And it really will take an all out effort, both on an individual, a community, association, an industry, um, global level um, to address some of these. But I'm very confident that our association is strong and there is progress that we can drive um, working together and working with the industry. So if you look at number one on the top left, um, last year, Mario and the team launched the, the PATA Crisis Resource Center, and that's readily available to anyone in the industry. Um, there are a series of great playbooks there. You just take a five-minute survey, and um, various um, industries within the travel sector, you'll find a playbook um, that can help you formulate your plan um, at various points in the, uh, the crisis, whether your cases are rising, plateauing, or decreasing. Um, so please check out that resource center. It is getting updated regularly. Um, and so it will change. If you looked at it a year ago, you can go in again and find more resources. Number two on the bottom left, um, a few weeks ago, I launched a government members only session. And the objective there was for us to support our member destinations in rapidly learning from each other in terms of what's working. You know, this is really a time that um, we're all operating on the best available information and we need to recover it collectively, not just individually. And so we've hosted two sessions so far and I'm excited to you know, be co-hosting that with good colleagues at World Bank who also saw this as a need and will be um, hosting more sessions in the coming weeks and months. 
Number three on the top of the timeline, innovation workshop series. Now this is a series that we've launched recently. Um, and the intent is to create a series of webinars that are really informative and focus on how to's. And they also focus on solutions that are very economical and um, can help you know, various uh, members of our association in terms of their recovery. So the topics will be um, wide ranging. They'll include topics such as digital marketing, um, leadership and resilience, um, COVID safety practices. Last week, we hosted a session with Linda Williams on top PR and marketing tips. And originally it was focused on top um, small hotels, but actually the webinar is relevant to all different players in the travel and tourism industry. So please go to our website and you'll find a session like that. We have two more planned next week. Um, and you know, I hope you find those useful and applicable just for you to action within your businesses. We've also launched an innovation idea hub, which is on our website. And that's really the idea, the, it crowdsources various business innovations that have evolved over the last 18 months. And this is meant for your reference, your use, your inspiration. Um, and it's open, you know, open for submissions from anyone regarding read an interesting article, an interesting uh, business idea that's been launched. You can send us an article. It's very quick and easy. And we continue to focus on crowdsourcing from all of you, the members, on um, SDG specific innovations that you yourself have championed. And we're very happy to continue profiling those. <laughs> Number four, the need for frequent insights and trends is higher than ever. And we've got a fantastic network within the association to, <clears throat> to have subject matter experts report on data trends, uh, consumer insights from all different perspectives. And so we will be delivering more frequently um, webinars that can provide you with that real-time information and insight. Number five, and this is the subject of today's um, webinar, is vaccine equity. Um, while vaccines are not necessarily for everyone, it is important that vaccine equity is in place. And for those, you know, for those who, um, who cannot afford it currently or are not within reach, you know, it's really important that we drive progress on this and give vaccines to those that are eligible and, um, and interested in, in, in the interest of laying that foundation. Number six is to strengthen the Pata global community. Um, we'll continue to, where, at, wherever possible, deliver on physical events because nothing can replace face-to-face, -face. but we know that we'll be living in a hybrid world in the coming months and possibly, you know, coming years. And so I think what's important is for us to, to leverage the best of both worlds and find ways to connect our members, to connect them to partners and business opportunities and long running relationships. I think one of the, the cornerstones or the foundations of the Pata brand and community is the depth of the business relationships and friendships that are formed at our um, events and that's been historically. And so what I look forward to is working with the team to source different ways and different formats in order for us to continue that in a hybrid world. Number seven is our collaboration with global org organizations. Um, I'm on a bi-weekly global travel and tourism COVID task force and we are regularly sharing with each other best practices and initiatives that are happening around the globe um, in, in order to best determine how can we best support the industry. And then lastly, um, we've embarked in, in June, we launched work on a destination resilience initiative. And this is with the support of uh, BNZ and GIZ. And we've partnered and formed a 20 person expert task force. And this is basically to look at, you know, as we are readying for opening and um, tourism development, sometimes in markets that were uh, less developed prior to COVID, um, how can we best ready them to be resilient? And I'll show you just a, a quick view on the next few pages on some of these initiatives. And so please, you know, check out your inboxes for the email on summarizing these initiatives, and we'll be reporting in the coming months and weeks um, more details on each of them. So this is a, the landing site, the Crisis Resource Center that anyone can find on our website. 
five, quick five minute survey and it'll take you to a playbook that um, would suit your circumstances and needs. Next page. Um, this is a snapshot from our first um, government only session. And as I mentioned, you know, we are going to work to support our government members in getting the best available information and learn rapidly together. So on August 4th, we profiled some markets that are ahead of the curve in terms of opening Hawaii, Maldives, and Phuket Sandbox. On August 17th, um, we had this team, the COVAX UNICEF team, come and talk about. Um, the similar over, uh, overview and vaccine acceptance strategies. And in the upcoming sessions, we'll be engaging COVID safety advisors, COVID tech solutions, and addi additional destinations from around the globe to share in their experiences so we can help the, the travel community learn faster together. Next. Um, this is a view to the Travel Innovations Hub that I mentioned, where we're crowdsourcing ideas. Next page. And you'll see these mini summaries um, that can provide inspiration or ideation for um, different innovations that have occurred since the start of COVID for our sector. Next page. Um, and today I'm very you know, excited to have this team. Um, Pata would like to lend its platform and support in this um, drive for vaccine equity in the form of advocacy, industry education, fundraising, and if they ever need it, support to logistics, because certainly, you know, travel infrastructure can be very powerful in terms of supporting um, the delivery of these vaccines to some very remote places. And I'm confident that the Pata network is um, a great source to, to possibly fill that need. And then lastly, our tourism destination resilience blueprint. So this is really looking at, in addition to health and safety, which we've seen is so important, um, there are other categories that destinations really need to consider, environment, econ economy, community, and the visitors in terms of planning for a resilient destination. Now we're piloting this program. It's the content is work in progress, but we will be piloting in Q4. Um, online training and where possible in market training, um, starting with four of our uh, partner member destinations. And, you know, as we know, it, you know, whether it's, um, whether it's weather storms or it's um, um, tourism surges, you know, I think that that's one of the, the issues that we'll need to anticipate, you know, as we get our destinations healthy and ready for arrivals, probably the leaders will be um, facing surges. And so there are other um, considerations that we need to prepare for in terms of um, planning this industry recovery. So my hope is that you find this eight point plan. It touches on the various needs that we have at a member level and at a, an industry level. And um, with that, you know, I'd like to introduce We'll turn it over to um, a video now. And this is with uh, my partner for the government meetings from the World Bank, um, uh, John Paratet. He gave a nice message regarding the initiative that World Bank is doing in terms of supporting vaccine equity. So over to the video, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining. And thanks to Liz and all of her team at Parta for this wonderful series of uh, webinars exploring tourism recovery from COVID-19. We at the bank are very proud to be part of this initiative as part of our own support for tourism recovery, particularly in those countries of the developing world where the bank is most active. Firstly, my apologies for not being able to be there in person. Our team would love to be viewing that, but with time differences and other commitments, sometimes that's just not so simple. But please be assured the World Bank is very supportive of destinations sharing their experiences so that everyone can learn through this whole process of a new crisis that we're facing. One thing we have learned so far is that vaccinations are going to play a key role, not only in the destinations recovery, but in the source markets and this interplay between the two. We've seen some very interesting examples of that already. And we've seen some very high levels of vaccination in the Asia Pacific region already. And that provides a strong foundation for us to talk about and plan for recovery. It was in the first of these webinars that we heard a very interesting case, the case of the Sandbox Initiative in Thailand. Now, there's a recovery program that is very much driven 
by high vaccination uh, rates amongst the local population. In addition to the World Bank's tourism recovery program, we're also supporting vaccine rollout through the bank's broader health policies and programs. As of July this year, the World Bank had approved operations to support vaccine rollout in 54 countries that amounted to $4.6 billion. So today it's going to be great to hear from UNICEF about the COVAX initiative and their access to COVID-19 tools accelerator and how destinations can leverage these resources to support the recovery process. Many thanks again to you all for joining and now it's back to the party team. Well, thank you very much, Liz, and thank you to John. I know he's not here, but thank you so much for his support to PADA uh, over the past uh, month and so and to all his team. Now, before we get to our guest speakers, I do want to play you one video from UNICEF uh, bef uh, just to sort of set the stage. So with that, uh, I'll ask my colleague to please play the next video. What does it take to make history? What does it take to fight for equality? To race to bring a pandemic to a halt? A pioneering spirit, relentless innovation, 75 years of delivering results, a global network of partners, the passion of a team who will never give up. This is how UNICEF became the largest vaccine buyer and distributor in the world. This is how UNICEF helps vaccinate nearly half the world's children every year in the hardest to reach places. Our systems were made for this. Our people were made for this. We know we can make history happen. We can get the COVID-19 vaccines to at least 20% of the world's population by the end of the year, delivered to the countries that need assistance, for the healthcare workers and vulnerable populations, the people who need it most, but we need you, because history is not made just by one, but by the collective, by the choices we make, and by the partnerships we forge. Together, we can make this happen. Together, we can make history. So, so we've set the stage a bit for our next guest speakers. And with that, let me just share my screen real quickly. Uh, I'd like to welcome our guest speakers for today's webinar. We have, as I said, from the UNICEF lead on private sector partnerships and fundraising for COVAX, uh, and Act A. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Liz Case. Liz, uh, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, hello, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, and I have a few slides and, and my colleagues are with me today and we have a few slides to share and we're really looking forward then to the Q&A afterwards with you. So Paul, it'd be wonderful if we could set up the, the presentation and I'll just move through some slides. So this is a short presentation to tell you a little bit about uh, not just ACT A and COVAX, but also what UNICEF is doing in our role there. We really are in a race to end this pandemic, to end the acute phase of this pandemic. And we're only gonna do that if we, have what we call global vaccine equity, because no one is safe until everyone is safe. And we really are um, in, in what our colleagues at the World Health Organization call the race of our lives. And it's not yet a fair race. There are countries that are much further ahead than others. And our job is to make sure that we make this an equal response where everyone is taken care of and we can restart the world in a sense. So the next slide, please. So this won't be news to any of you. This is the incidence of COVID-19 cases from the start of this, this year to um, end of July. Um, there were more deaths in 2021 by June than there were in all of 2020. So there is no question that this um, pandemic continues. And I thought you may be interested to see kind of the breakdown by region where the Delta variant is really driving an increase in cases. And our hope, of course, now is with these vaccines, that even where COVID may be moving through populations where the most vulnerable people are vaccinated, what we need to see and want to see is that hospitalization and death is dropping. Um, so that is how we're trying very much to control this acute phase. 
Sadly, 4.43 million lives have been lost already and 212 million people have been infected. And that is based on the levels of testing and tracking that we're doing. We expect, of course, those numbers are probably higher. Next slide, please. So you may have heard in the news or maybe aware of something we call the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. Um, we'll talk in a minute about the COVAX pillar, but I wanted to show you this slide. It's a little busy and I won't speak to all of it, but really to just show how in sort of March, April of 2020, the world really came together and said, we have a global pandemic on our hands and we need to come together in partnership to see what we can do to end this pandemic. And this really brought together governments of the world, an enormous number of private sector players, particular pharmaceuticals, health companies who had to really now focus on coming up with the tools that we needed. And they broke those down into three pillars. COVAX is the vaccine pillar. And in 2020, that was all about the discovering, developing, creating, and working on the manufacturing of the vaccines. And so we are now in 2021 and we have an enormous array of vaccines and now we have to get them where they need to go. And of course, there's what we call the therapeutics pillar. So the treatment, what is, what can we use? Now, what new treatments can we come up with and what existing treatments can we use? And we found oxygen has been a really, really important one, the ready supply of oxygen to help people get through some of the tough stages of, of COVID-19. And of course, the diagnostics or testing pillar. And you're, not, you're blind if you don't see where the vaccine is moving. The testing is really our eyes of where this is going, how to contain outbreaks, what variants are moving through. And that's really, really important for the movement of people across the world. And then cutting across all of this along the bottom is, is the health systems connector. But Paul, if you move to the next slide, I'll give a little more detail on these pillars. So with each of these pillars, we do have targets that we want to reach. And the COVAX pillar, is to get 2 billion doses delivered by the end of 2021 um, and actually to go much higher than that into 2022. So the 2 billion doses was really to target, that's not a random number, that's about 20% of the global population. And it covers the 3% of the world that are healthcare and workers and frontline workers. So that can include first responders, um, healthcare workers, people in hospital settings and in home settings and the most vulnerable, so those with underlying conditions and the elderly. And if we can vaccinate those people, we can really massively reduce those most at risk of death. And that changes, of course, the face of the pandemic if, if we can really reduce those numbers. Um, and then the therapeutics, we talked about, we need to get 165 million therapeutics to low and middle income countries. And we really do need oxygen and that has been um, on the forefront of everyone's mind. And then testing kits, we need to massively ramp up testing. There are countries where testing is very um, standard, it's available, and there are many countries where testing has been much more difficult. And the health systems connector that cuts across all of this, these are the people that are gonna use these tools that are created and the systems and the supply chains. And this is really, really important. If we don't have healthcare professionals who are well-trained, who know what they're doing, who are safely protected with masks and gloves, we cannot use the tools that are available to us to end this pandemic. So we have some new targets that we're focused on and globally with the World Health Organization, with Gabi, with ourselves and with CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, we really want to get everyone, every country to have 10% of their population vaccinated by the end of September, 40% by the end of 2021, and 70% of the world vaccinated by mid 2022. Now that's gonna be a mix of vaccines that COVAX provides that are paid for and delivered and vaccines that countries themselves are buying through bilateral deals. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along. Next slide, please. So as an overall summary, there are more than 4.9 billion doses that have been administered globally. And that means doses that have gone into people's arms. So we're getting close to 5 billion. This is a number from yesterday. So it's incredible to see these numbers go up every day. Now, COVAX has delivered 215.5 million doses to 138 countries and territories. This is through UNICEF. And this is the part of the, the funded vaccines, this 20 to 30% of the population that will be covered by vaccines that have been paid for by donors. But when we look at low income countries versus high income countries, 
Um, and now this, of course, doesn't talk about middle income countries, but of the low income countries, only 1.6% of those countries have vaccinated populations. And of course, on average, it's getting close to 60% in high income countries. And testing in high income countries is 100 times the rate of low income countries. So that's what we're really focused on for the rest of this year. Now, we are very much on track to supply these 2 billion doses. Um, so we, the hope was by the end of the year, it's looking to be more in quarter one, 2022, because we have had challenges with vaccine supply. And so we've had to push very hard for dose sharing. We've done a lot of advocacy with governments of the world to please share doses that you are holding in warehouses that you haven't yet accessed and make sure that the supply coming online is spread fairly. Now we are moving into a very intense period of rapidly increasing supply of vaccines, and this is a good thing, but it also presents challenges to countries where they can get an enormous amount of vaccines at one time and may have difficulty absorbing them. And this has been the case no matter whether your country is low, middle or high income, we've seen it all over the world. There is a period of preparation and ramp up that we need to support countries in getting ready. And of course, we have the Delta variant. This is really driving increased COVID cases. And if we cannot um, get people vaccinated, there is a risk of another variant that will set all of us back. And that is the last thing I think that anyone wants. So with this incredible need for testing, oxygen vaccines and strong health systems, the whole thing works together. And of course, we're fundraising to fill the gaps that it'll take to get these countries prepared and to turn vaccines into vaccinations. Next slide. I will not read this to you. This is a busy slide to tell you what our role is in ACT Day, and let me explain it to you just very simply. Our role is really a very physical role. So we coordinate, we work with all the vaccine manufacturing companies, and we coordinate agreements, sign legal agreements with them so that we can coordinate the, the procurement, so the purchasing and the distribution of all of the vaccines in COVAX, but we also deal with syringes testing kits, oxygen installation, and all the things associated with that and personal, what we call PPE or personal protective equipment. So this is an enormous logistics coordination and transportation um, year for us. There's an incredible amount of what we call cold chain, the refrigerators and the, the freezer boxes and the refrigerated trucks that I need to go out. Um, in particular, vaccines like Pfizer that require ultra cold chain, so minus 70, minus 80 degrees. This is an enormous logistical challenge, but as you saw in the video, we have been doing this for children's vaccines for decades. We are the number one vaccine buyer in the world. So we have those supply chains in place, even if they've never been on such sort of hyperdrive. Um, I will say that we are vaccine agnostic, which means that we are guided by the World Health Organization on which vaccines we can buy. But if we're working in countries where governments are rolling out vaccines that they have purchased, we support regardless. So our aim is to get people vaccinated and support governments in doing that. And I wanna kind of point out that vaccines are ultimately purchased for governments to roll out in their populations. And so we, we follow the, the needs and the guidance of those governments. And we do an enormous amount on vaccine hesitancy and helping get with information. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Next slide. So this is just a quick slide from the COVAX facility. I wanted to show you the global supply forecast. It's a set of numbers just to show you how much it's ramping up after August, September, October. And you can see those numbers are jumping enormously. And that's sort of half a million to a million vaccines flying out every minute in airplanes to countries all over the world. That in many of these without COVAX that would not have yet had any vaccines. Next slide, please. And I thought this was kind of a fun comparison. These are the, this is a, um, the vaccine rollouts of other vaccines, sort of classic children's vaccines. You can see along the bottom, mumps, rubella, all kinds of, and how many years it takes to roll out a vaccine to the level of coverage. And then the red line that goes straight up in the air on the far right, that's the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines. We've never seen anything like it. We've never done anything like it in the world. I think we should be really proud of what is happening and how we've done it. It's not have been without its challenges. It is a bit of a roller coaster, but um, the tools are out there and we're making them happen. And it is incredible to see what we can do and what we still have to do. And it's wonderful to be talking to you about how we can work together on this. Next slide. 
So there are challenges country by country. Every country is its own ecosystem, its own situation. And so what, but we are seeing common problems come out of every country as vaccines are being rolled out. And this is sort of a, a list of the things that we need to work with, with our partners, with governments. When you have multiple vaccines, you have to train healthcare workers in the use of multiple management of vaccines. People should come back for the same vaccine, managing people coming back. Um, the cost, the resources needed to um, amplify the healthcare workers that are needed to really roll this out. The moment they arrive, these vaccines have a short shelf life. Um, most of them are only for emergency use listing, giving them just six months of shelf life. When they get into a country, they have got to be used right away. And then how do we handle vaccine hesitancy? Um, we're going to have a little bit more on that, but we've never rolled out um, a vaccine um, with social media so active, with people so aware of different brands of vaccines, it's really challenging. And then we have to monitor the safety, making sure all healthcare workers and governments are tracking any adverse effects, making sure people are being cared for. Um, and then target populations, are we reaching the right people? How are we managing the knowledge? How are we monitoring how it's going? And how are we continuing to handle what we call routine immunization for children and all our other health programs? Because UNICEF is taking this task on for COVAX on top of all our other programming for children. So it, it is quite um, a lot to balance, but it, it's been really interesting. Next slide, please. And so quickly, as I last couple of slides, what have we been able to do? We stockpile syringes so that they're where they need to be. We stock, stockpile um, and, and put in place cold chain, all of the refrigerators that are needed all over the world. Um, we have rolled out vaccines, but syringes, vaccines, and personal protective equipment. And we have already sent some one, almost 1 1.7 billion routine vaccines this year alone. So the, the COVID rollout is on top of our normal routine vaccine rollout, and um, it is a mil a almost a military operation. We have good private sector partnerships to help us support this surge of logistics. Um, the Humanitarian Air Freight Initiative, World Economic Forum, we are working with IATA, um, partnerships that were, provide the, both in-kind and financial support are really, really helpful. And we're, we're just supporting countries all over the world and whatever they need on preparing, on spreading the word, and on protecting their healthcare workers with the equipment that they need. Next slide. This is my last slide, just to really Thank you and, and, and say that there, we are really thrilled that PATA would be able to help us join the race to end this pandemic. We will only do this together. There's a lot of advocacy and communication that you and your companies and your partnerships and your networks can do. Um, we need to talk about vaccine equity, but there's all kinds of other things we can talk about. Um, we wanna talk about kids getting back to school um, in September, and that's gonna be something we talk about associated with the pandemic. And we also need funding. We need to turn these vaccines, which are already paid for, they've been funded through COVAX and, and governments around the world, some generous donations, but that's just one step. And we need to turn them into, vac into vaccinations. We need to provide testing kits. We need to provide treatment such as oxygen. And our funding ask is just around 969 million US dollars. It's just been revised, but we have received over 500 million, close to 500 and a half, $550 million already for this work. So we're trying to close this gap of about 320 million. And of course, we don't stop protecting children from the impacts of the pandemic. We do all the other things that are associated with that. So anyone in PATA who would be interested in working with UNICEF, it, it can be on ending the pandemic, but it can also be on any of the other things we're doing to stop the impact of the pandemic on children. With that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Shweta Dahaya. Shweta, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Liz has taken you through the ACTA, COVAX pillars and how UNICEF has been playing a role, uh, one of the key roles that we've also been playing is working towards delivering vaccine critical messages to be able to fight vaccine hesitancy, to be able to give messages around COVID appropriate behavior. Uh, could you please change the slide, Paul? Yes, yeah, so but in this day, age, and era where we have so much information available on social media, 
it has been realized we are not only fighting an epidemic, we are also fighting an infodemic. There is fake news spreading much faster and more easily than the virus, which is just as dangerous, which is creating myths and creating misinformation among people that is holding them back from vaccination, that is holding them back from having the right kind of behavior during this epidemic. And we've realized that vaccine behaviors may be affected by multiple social or psychological factors that may run quite deep, which includes people's attitudes, feelings, their cultural backgrounds, their moral values, how their thoughts are perceived, how they are formed. So UNICEF has realized that it is very important that we do not only create messages, but we work with the community to understand what is it that is holding them back from going ahead and receiving vaccination. So we, we did uh, specific country level uh, health-based surveys along with our health workers and understood communities. And accordingly, we tailored our communication and messaging in the countries. And we've tried innovative ways to deliver those messages in the countries. I would like to use a key example from South Africa right now through a video to show you how UNICEF has been taking these messages through very critical carriers uh, from in the community to the uh, common people who are able to promote vaccine uh, conducive behaviors amongst them. Could you please play the video? Right now, the case at end. The said ranking the empty batuba as we speak, and it drag ear daily messages. Eba kutaza uba mabab seven sets of behaviors. The petangazo the prevention. The track is uh, a, a major contribution by UNICEF. It's one of our, you know, innovative methods of bringing messages to the people. The whole aim is bringing these messages to where the people are. It is capable of broadcasting the messages as it moves. And you can see the people turning with the track. You can see them following the track. You see your children responding to the messages. We work with um, the Department of Health at sub-national level, at provincial level, at district level, to identify people within these communities who will come up and share their stories. These are authentic stories um, from a wide range of people. It could be your healthcare worker, it could be your child at home. So those stories of devastation, you know, bring a message with them. The message of protect yourself, protect others, the messages we get from communities are in local languages and the messages have always been around prevention. South Africa, join my team, join the vaccination. We have now incorporated vaccination, recognizing the vaccination as part of prevention. As much as we look forward to vaccination, um, we need to understand that we need to continue with non-pharmaceutical interventions. <laughs> The 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 C for say HIV and AIDS in a Kosia Benza, by an ATP.
When Iskati say to Jangom Pagati, see Figa, Uguti, Sinigas, well, Lomcomo, Sipum and Gobum Gago Bay to Uhamba, Sio Tata, Lomcomo. V for vaccinated, Viva. Let's get vaccinated. Thank you, Paul. Could we come back to the presentation? Uh, that was about South Africa. And here I'll just take you briefly now through an example of Pakistan, where our team has very successively used social media analytics to create the messaging around COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. So UNICEF worked toward analyzing the social media messages and used social analytics qualitatively and as well as quantitatively to understand various platforms, the various helpline data that was available, knowledge and practice surveys were employed, and uh, information from leading journals was used to understand and design our strategic action and sector response. Who are the key stakeholders that we need to engage with? Who are the ones who should be delivering the message? What is the kind of messaging that is required? What is it that is holding people back? What are the attitudes, beliefs, feelings that are prevalent in the community so that we are able to target the issue and able to increase the rate of vaccination in the community? Next slide, please. So it was realized when we started working on our first survey that 69% of respondents think they will remain protected if they pray five times a day. Via social listening, we got to know there are widespread anxieties concerning COVID vaccination while fasting because they felt that while fasting, it, should, it is not something that they should be taking COVID vaccination. So the recommendation that was found through the survey was that conduct a high profile meeting with senior religious leaders to agree on Ramadan guidelines and encourage them to practice positive bottling. They needed to be our modeling people who should be themselves taking the vaccine so that larger part of community can follow suit. Uh, the president conducted a national meeting with religious influencers to discuss the new 20 point Ramadan guidelines. Staying and praying at home during Ramadan is halal. But then it was important that as one of the key guidelines, people stay back at home that promotes COVID-19 appropriate behavior, but they also step out only for vaccination. So that kind of a 20 point kind line agenda was created. Next slide, please. For our sector response, we realized that early reporting of stigma and violence against health professionals was there. Uh, it was indicated that health workers were increasingly effect, infected with COVID-19, as in most of the countries. And then they were also being blamed for community transmission. So we worked towards creating a campaign to train health workers so that they, have, they are well trained on how to be able to not get infected. They have the right kind of equipments with them. They should be able to, they should be well equipped. They are, uh, they have the right PPE kits with them. And it was up to the community and the government and other media to rebuild trust and promote their dedication and heroism to the public so that people understand that they are the ones who are there out there to help. And they are the ones who are putting their lives on the line to be able to support the community. So we initiated a trust building we care campaign with government to train health workers, provide PP equipments and promote appreciation and solidarity towards them. Using mass and social media awareness through religious networks really helped in this whole campaign and a positive social image building for the health workers. Next slide, please. In terms of our risk communication and community engagement in interventions, we realized that only increase in vaccine information does not make a difference in vaccine acceptance. Only creating vaccine messages were not helping us. 
So what is it that was helping us? People's trusted source of information strongly determines their attitude towards the vaccine. So bringing in religious leaders remained a key source of information and also misinformation. So we really used them as our positive models and then build on with the government to be able to use that platform to get the right source of information to people. And that really helped us see a bump in the vaccinations from January to February, from 78 million to 103 million. So we advocated for a high level consensus meeting with regional leaders to agree on national Ramadan guidelines that really made all the difference in bringing the right kind of messages to the people and bringing them for vaccinations and also keeping them back at home for COVID appropriate behavior so that the transmission is further prevented. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for listening in. And now to join us in this race, we would like you to contact our partnership manager, Dipali Sooth, and kindly go to this link to join us further. I would like to now invite in Rahul Bansal from, our, from UNICEF India country office, who will be able to share the case of India and how private sector has played a key role along with UNICEF to fight this epidemic there. Thank you. Thank you, Shweta. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Rahul Bansal. I lead corporate partnership for UNICEF in India. And uh, I'll talk about how UNICEF in India reached out to private sector to really amplify the messages of uh, COVID vaccination and COVID appropriate behavior. So uh, as we know, India was no exception to the impact of COVID and uh, the Prime Minister launched one of the world's largest vaccination drive earlier this year in, uh, in January. And uh, uh, the focus was initially healthcare workers and frontline workers and ambitious targets were set and the government was very keen to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Now, as soon as the vaccination campaign was launched, we also saw globally and not just uh, in India, uh, massive disinformation, misinformation going around in the news and kind of uh, social media which discouraged a lot of people to go for vaccination. And, uh, and Shweta talked about how uh, we worked in uh, Pakistan, for example, to address uh, misinformation, disinformation, which was leading to vaccine hesitancy. There was news around uh, vaccine having uh, inappropriate impact. Uh, there was a lot of information around WhatsApp and WhatsApp had become a university in itself. Uh, while the vaccination drive was picking up, uh, India saw a second wave of COVID in uh, April, May, June this year, and we hit almost 400, 450,000 cases a day. And that encouraged or pushed a lot of people to go out and get vaccinated. So while on one side, India was facing vaccine hesitancy and people were not very comfortable in going for vaccination, India, simultaneously also started facing eagerness when there was over demand from certain sections of the society. So we had this two problems of eagerness as well as hesitancy occurring at the same time in the country while the vaccination drive was being launched. So it was very important for, for, for the government and for UNICEF to work very closely with the government to build that confidence in vaccine and while the vaccines were being rolled out to remind people about the social vaccine and the social vaccine is the COVID appropriate behavior to wear masks, to, to uh, encourage hand hygiene and social distancing. And uh, we've been in this COVID for over a year. We know there's a lot of fatigue. We know there is over messaging about vaccination and COVID appropriate behavior. So we really had to be more creative and look for new channels to send the same message, but in a different way to people. And that's when UNICEF uh, uh, decided to reach out to the private sector in India and uh, work with the and bring the, the the communication channels, the outreach, and the the ability to mobilize resources uh, from the private sector in India. The overall objective for private sector to come on board was to also give them a unique opportunity to participate in solving 
the biggest challenge which the country had faced. Initially, the whole campaign was was managed by the government, and the partnership through UNICEF gave them the opportunity to to really deploy their resources and their communication channels to amplify the vaccine, COVID vaccine uh, messaging. It also encouraged private sector to bring their employees and their customers on board and to engage them more meaningfully around this big issue. And uh, uh, in the country, we were able to reach out to the segments of society, which otherwise would have been very challenging for, for just for the government or for the government and UNICEF together. So uh, through private sector, through their social media channels, through employees, there are companies with uh, over 100,000 employees uh, through in their manufacturing units, through uh, hoarding, standees, etc. We worked with private sector to spread the message. Now, when we were looking at uh, working with the private sector, it was really important to achieve scale and to really have companies which are able to uh, to scale up the messages very quickly and also have the ability to influence behavior, which encourages people to have more faith in the vaccine and are following the COVID appropriate behavior. So we reached out to the biggest companies in the country, which are either big employers or have big customer base. We also looked for companies which have big social media channels or uh, who will be willing to, to send these messages through different points of sales or are big media users or buyers. And then private sector, all UNICEF needed more funds to be able to amplify these messages. So we looked for companies which would be able to support us with financial or other resources. And then for us, it was really important to recognize the participation of private sector and uh, what private sector was doing to support the, the overall advocacy around COVID vaccination. And Shweta talked about uh, uh, kind of looking for trusted sources. And uh, in India also we did, we were listening to what people were talking about, what was really important for the campaign to be successful. And we found that television, for example, is the, is, is, is what people trust uh, the most. And uh, so we started looking for ways where private sector could come forward and put more and more messages on television, whether it's through the commercials or through panel discussions, etc. But we also know if you look at the kind of bottom middle half, uh, these are social media channels, WhatsApp, uh, you know, family members who in turn are influenced by the social media and the and the WhatsApp were really really important. So. We worked with private sector in designing messages which could be amplified through these channels, but we also uh, made sure the messages which were going out were all government approved. Those were in line with what government was communicating around COVID vac vaccination. And uh, we also encouraged uh, uh, UNICEF to be there on those messages to ensure people know this is credible and this is coming from a credible source. Now, how can private sector and some of you amplify the messages? Digital marketing, we know it's the easiest, very easy and very quick to scale up. And uh, you could look at different social media channels to put the messages out. Uh, events, uh, is, are there ways where you could host digital events, where you could bring people together? Could you also celebrate kind of key moments where the country has achieved specific milestones in vaccination? And uh, uh, could you also look at uh, reinforcing government messages around your uh, kind of factories offices? Uh, convening, uh, are there kind of sections of society which are which have specific concerns about hesitancy or eagerness? Can you bring them around the round table? Can you bring experts and organize webinars for your employees or for your customers? Are there people who are champions of vaccination and for example, sharing photos? Uh, and uh, do you have influence on mainstream media? Could you write op-eds? Do you buy adverts on television? And could you use those adverts to put messages around vaccination, uh, etc.? And we've just pulled out some of the messages which went out. Uh, as you see, DBS Bank uh, uh, put these messages out in support of UNICEF. So when these creatives would be sent over social media or over WhatsApp, people know it's come from two very credible brands, DBS and UNICEF, and the information which is in these uh, creatives is authentic. Similarly, from a few other companies, uh, the messages which went out and uh, 
We also organize webinars for uh, quite a few corporates in India as mythbusters to tell them more about vaccination. Uh, you know, different kind of uh, doubts people might have about when to get vaccinated, etc. So, uh, uh, so this is just a quick overview of how private sector came forward to support the overall vaccination campaign in India. And I hope you can also do uh, the same thing for your sector and for your country. Thank you. So over to Paul. Well, thank you much, Raul. And uh, I'd like to welcome back Liz and Shweta. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, if you have any questions, feel free to please drop them into the Q&A. Rahul, you can come back too if, if, if you want to help uh, add, to any, and add to any of the answers or answer any of the questions. I'll start with one question before we get to the, the, the questions we have so far. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about vaccine passports in, the, the, in our industry. And I just want to know if, um, if UNICEF has, you know, what's your position on it, or if you've had conversations with other organizations about this idea of vaccine passports. Thanks very much. So um, to respond to the, the concept of a vaccine passport, just generally speaking, um, UNICEF, we follow the guidance of the World Health Organization on all health related matters. But in terms, but we also have a, some pretty, some strong underlying principles and equity is one of them. And that would include, until everyone in the world has access to a vaccine, having a vaccine passport is not an equal, it's not a fair measure. So UNICEF's position is that for example, we want all schools to open regardless of whether children are vaccinated, teachers are vaccinated. There are ways we can control this pandemic without having to revert to a, a vaccine passport because vaccines are not around the world where they need to be. So our position on that really is, although it's national governments that take these ultimate decisions on this, we are pushing and advocating for sort of equity and openness to the extent we can while controlling the pandemic using the measures we have. Okay, thanks. Uh, we got some questions here, so please do keep the questions coming. I'll start off with the first one. This one was 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 submitted very very early in the presentation. So uh, this is from I guess an anonymous attendee. But the Act A plan is ideal. However, the reality on the ground is miles apart from this plan. There's immense inequality in the distribution of the vaccine globally, but also at a country level. How do you monitor that the vaccines provided by Covax are distributed to the people that were intended for two or four? Yeah, that's a super question. So um, we have a number of ways. Um, because UNICEF has country offices with, with healthcare workers and people who work with governments every year anyway on vaccines, we have teams of people that are quite closely connected to um, the healthcare, the health ministries and the healthcare workers in the country. So we're able to train and observe in that way and be with these healthcare workers in certain countries in support of that where we're needed. But every country that receives a vaccine from COVAX needs to provide an, a, a national vaccine deployment plan where they outline who they will give these vaccines to. And they're provided on the basis that they are going to the healthcare workers, frontline workers, first responders, and the most vulnerable populations. And I can say countries have a lot of incentive to vaccinate these people because those are the ones that are most likely to be getting unwell and overflowing hospitals. What we are seeing is that so far, generally, um, almost all vaccines are going to where they're needed. Initial um, shipments where we had sort of a million doses only tended to stay in those capital cities, but that is where most healthcare workers were. That's who was getting vaccinated. And then after that, so we have pre-plans that people have to submit. We're on the grounds where we can observe and participate as much as we are involved. And then after that, governments report out, give stats, give um, reporting and we have all kinds of sort of systems set up to capture the data and see where that's moving. And I will add that, for example, Bhutan in July, back in June, actually, I think finished vaccinating their entire eligible population. So there are countries that have really delivered in, in a, now Bhutan's a, a special case, a small country. Um, not every country has the simplicity that, that there was still complexity there. Um, but countries are by and large following the, pro the protocol because it is, it is in everyone's interest, theirs included. I just kind of wanted to follow up with this, on this kind of line of thinking though. You know, there's been a lot of talk of this, this booster shot. Does that change um, sort of the planning around, around, you know, have you had to shift and change some of your supply, you know, some of your shipments out or, or, or your strategy moving forward? So supply has, all, has been a concern this whole year so far. There is 
so far getting your hands on supply is, is challenging, but that is in changing. But yes, in the month of June, we had an enormous advocacy push with governments of the world, high income governments to share their doses. We will do the same where we have a position along with WHO on boosters. We, we would like to ask that boosters not be used until the world is able to vaccinate at least 20% of their population um, and protect the vulnerable from death. So we are in constant discussions behind the scenes, publicly even, to really encourage that supply continues and that boosters only be used in countries where there is enough supply for the rest of the world as well. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll go to the next question. This is from our good friend T.I. Uh, his question is, one situation that now exists is that some countries do not regard that all vaccines are equal. They may not accept tourists vaccinated with certain vaccines manufactured in certain countries. This will hamper tourism to return to normal. We need the UN, WHO, UNWTO, IATA, IATA governments, airlines, and airports to come to a common understanding. How would I? Uh, I would I agree guess, with yeah. that. That's a great. That's a great comment. I mean, absolutely. So. WHO approves the vaccines that we're using within COVAX and the ones that UNICEF buys. And they've, they've approved a large number of vaccines and, and we can share that list with you. Um, all of those vaccines do what they need to do, all of them. They, they, they reduce hospitalization and death and they stop the acute phase of the pandemic. And they reduce, if people do still get COVID with, when they're vaccinated, um, what we're finding is that the viral load is lower and it can help reduce um, variants from, from coming out. So every single approved vaccine that we're using does the job it needs to do. And so our position is absolutely, and we're pushing for this position, that all vaccinated, that there's equality across these approved vaccines. Now, an unapproved vaccine would be different. if We don't know the efficacy of it through WHO, but any approved vaccine should be accepted equally. I agree on that point about a common understanding. So then, so then is UNICEF help, help advocating with governments yeah. regarding that? Yes, yeah. so like- All the time. Any vaccine that's been, okay, all right. Okay, so we have a, I'll go to the next question here. It's a, a two part question here. So future outbound business and leisure travelers from the Philippines are worried that vaccines used on Filipinos uh, may not be recognized in their destination countries. Although we've been vaccinated with AstraZeneca, Moderna, Pfizer, Sputnik, et cetera. A lot of Filipinos were vaccinated with Sinovac because it was the first vaccine that reached our country in massive quantities. A lot of countries do not recognize Sinovac. What do we do? So similar to the question above, but Sinovac was recently approved by WHO. So that should massively help. Um, I think it was earlier August or in July. So it hasn't been indeed Sinovac and Sinopharm and the other and um, Chinese vaccines before they were approved by WHO. What was more challenging? Now that they're approved by WHO, we need to continue to advocate for equality among vaccines for travelers. Yeah. Okay. All right. And this is the second part of this question. Uh, a great majority of Filipinos who refuse to be vaccinated are solid believers in ivermectin. They tell everybody that ivermectin has been made them impenetrable to COVID-19. The government has come out with many press releases and open fora discussing the dangers of ivermectin, but its supporters counter it with their own success stories. What do we do? So, and it's not, it can be a lot of people um, have other things they think will protect them, but nothing protects people like the vaccine. So what we can do is what both Shweta and Raul were talking about, that we really just have to continue to get the message out over and over and over again. Um, so the kind of work that we can do, and I think it takes, we need to share stories. And, and sadly, sometimes, you know, it takes stories of people who, who get ill and who are able to talk about the fact that they weren't protected. So there's a lot of stories out there that we need to release. We need to make sure that people are aware of, but it's a challenge this with this uh, vaccine rollout. This is not a simple pandemic to, to tackle. And the more we can put um, respected, trusted voices behind this, the better. Yeah, so, you know, I, I don't know, I had mentioned that, you know, in India, UNICEF had reached out to the private businesses, but it can work the other way too, right? So private businesses can reach out to the UNICEF local offices to help getting that message out. You know, I, if there's, do you have toolkits or stuff to help them craft that messages? Is that correct? We do, we absolutely do. We have all the sort of underlying content and material and assets that, that companies can work with us and use to spread the word. And the more we put our voices together, the better we can tackle this infodemic that we've got on our hands. 
Right, and, and, and I guess we'll talk about infodemic. Uh, we have the next question from Mario Hardy. Anti-vaxxers are mostly a problem of the West. Most people in Asia want to get vaccinated and for borders to open as soon as possible. Sadly, in some Asian countries, there aren't enough vaccines available and the vaccination rate is far too low. How can UNICEF programs help accelerate vaccination in the region? So uh, I agree that we need that we need to pick up speed, but that is, I think, what we're really trying to do. I think you will see a big change in, in supply, and we're working with quite closely with manufacturers. There just wasn't the volume of vaccines in the first half of the year, um, and we had we did see a lot of very large bilateral deals taken up by high income countries, and that posed a problem. And we're really trying to correct that. So the most important thing is that we just continue to roll out vaccines every single day in the millions to every country and really track which countries, as soon as they've used their first um, batch that they're getting the next one and, and really monitor that that is happening and where we're seeing vaccines not being used. Um, you're right, it, it hasn't been an issue yet in countries that don't have enough vaccines. So let us, and it's something we've been saying, let us have the problem where we have too many vaccines, then we'll tackle, you know, so we want to tackle the problems one at one in order. So we prepare, we send out the messaging, but we need the vaccines there to see who's taking them. And then we can really pinpoint what the situation is. So these next six to 12 months are going to be absolutely critical. We have got to get everyone vaccinated by the summer of next year. And that is the target. Another question, just a question for myself. Does your vaccine uh, distribution strategy change if there's, you know, uh, a, a wave, you know, a site? You know, India, there was a, it was the first epicenter, and then we had Indonesia. I mean, not just for the vaccines, but even for like oxygen or, or other supplies. Does that does that distribution evolve as the situation evolves around the region? So yes, it does. So where there's an outbreak, we move very quickly to provide testing and oxygen, personal protective equipment, whatever we can provide to healthcare worker support, whatever we can. Once you have an outbreak rolling out the speeding vaccines there doesn't make too much difference because of the time required to. So we continue to push vaccines equitably um, because we're really trying to stop the variants from rolling out. Uh, of course, in, in some countries where they are able to increase it to, when you have an outbreak, it really focuses people's mind and the demand for vaccines suddenly goes up. So you will always see simultaneously a lot more people coming for the vaccine. And so we're really working on getting those systems ready and, and people able to, to churn out those vaccines. The challenge is when healthcare workers are diverted to hospitals because people are sick, they can't give vaccines. We have a limited supply of healthcare workers. So it's a really stressful and heartbreaking situation when we see an outbreak happen and countries are behind on vaccination rates. All the more reason that we have got to play with offense and defense. So the defense is social distancing, taking care of sick people, oxygen, but playing offense is getting everyone vaccinated and both games have to be happening at the same time. Great. Um, move on to the next question. Try, I want to try to get to as many questions here as possible here. So uh, the next question is currently in order to travel, a person must be fully vaccinated. Yet there are some people that is, are anti-vaccine. How can we handle people that are anti-vaccine and try to fake vaccine certificates? Yes, so the fake vaccine certificates are, are something that we have. We have teams working on innovations that really try and track and trace those so that we really include it, and including fake vaccines, by the way. So we have programs that we run that try to address this. But what we're seeing, and, and I, I think it differs from country by country, um, but in Europe, for example, where I am, you don't have to be vaccinated to travel, but you have to show proof of a negative COVID-19 test. So you need access to the test. So you either need access to the vaccine or a document showing you were recently tested, a PCR test in a laboratory. Um, so what we're finding, of course, in, in countries that have high vaccination rates, people have decided not to get vaccinated and governments are asking for this kind of proof, maybe to go into a restaurant, show that you're at least tested negative. Then we, we have a challenging situation on our hands because you have to deal with people who may be anti-vax, but then all the people who are vaccinated who are saying, please vaccinate yourself and protect us. We're in an interesting social dynamic and countries are handling that country by country. Um, so what we, oh, what we can do is make sure there's no fake vaccines, make sure there's no fake um, certificates to the extent we possibly can and encourage people to get vaccinated. They will become slightly more limited 
um, as time goes on, but we we get to see exactly what that means. Yeah, all, yeah. Only time will tell over the over the yeah. next, as you said, six months is, is extremely critical in in, in where, what direction the world turns. So uh, the next question, she uh, this person has two questions. This is Sir Johnny Nepali. Um, her first question is: Effectiveness of vaccination is hypothetically mentioned to one year time frame. Is this true? And then the second part of that is booster doses creating a lot of confusion in a country like Nepal, where people are yet to be vaccinated with the first dose. Such news creates a lot of confusion. So, yeah. I, I think that's a really good question. And I just want to highlight that there's confusion around so many things, including, you know, some countries saying we're not going to use this vaccine, but we're going to use the other. And every time that confusion lands, it increases our challenges with vaccine hesitancy. But this is a good question around boosters. And I'm not a doctor, so I can't give you a medical opinion on that. But what I can tell you is there is no consensus yet fully on whether boosters are required or not. But certain countries are moving towards boosters for their um, highly vulnerable populations. Um, you, you can look in the news and see sort of, for example, what Israel is deciding to do. We just don't yet know the long-term um, effectiveness of a vaccination and if boosters are required. What we do believe as UNICEF is that right now we have to vaccinate the world. And that is the best way to stop another variant that may render all the original vaccines not useful. So we have a real race to get people vaccinated and then we will have to look at the information on boosters. But I can tell you even in the medical community, um, we don't have consensus yet. Again, part of the sort of incredible, it's interesting to watch this, but it's not much fun, is it, when you don't have clear answers? Um, but as you said earlier, time, time will tell. Yeah, but I guess, I guess the most trusted source would be of course, checking the World Health Organization and, and their guidance in regard to Absolutely. boosters or one year time frame, right? I mean, I think Absolutely. we've always we've said part of always said that, you know, trust the experts, trust the data, trust the World Health Organization and their guidelines. So, you know, I, well, I think I, just if I could comment on that, you it's such a good point. We I don't WHO has never brought together such a world collection of experts as they have on this pandemic, people in WHO, but also the, you know, this group that advises them the unity and the, the, the brains and the thinking that is behind this, I, I, we've never seen parallel. So I think I have a lot of confidence in what's coming out of their recommendations and they're really doing it to end the pandemic. So I would highly recommend you keep an eye on the WHO website and we can share links with you to share with the network that we think are good. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, and we've been doing that since, you know, the, the outbreak and always make, making sure that, you know, we're, you know, that information, that the right information is getting to the right people and, you know, your trust in the right sources. I'm going to go to her second question here. Uh, uh, she's from Nepal, so she's saying Nepal's vaccine, vaccination is really slow. Uh, can UNICEF help in this, uh, I guess, for tourism to, to bounce back, to even start, right? Yes, and, and we are working in Nepal with the Nepal country office to the extent with the, sorry, with the government of Nepal um, to the extent we can. And I know that there was a, I know Nepal did, they used up their first doses very quickly, um, vaccinated really well, and then had to wait. And there was a delay for the second dose. Those doses have now arrived. But what we are doing is we understand the frustration and the, and the desire to have the vaccines that you need now. And and all we can say, I think, as UNICEF is to say, we are working, we're doing our best to make this happen as quickly as possible. Um, and we're a little bit at the mercy of world's events and manufacturing supply. But again, the next months coming should see a real increase in vaccine availability. And then we're just going to roll those out the minute we get them. Okay. Uh, there's some more questions here. Uh, how do you convince anti-vaxxers or how can the messaging be done, especially today, that even there has been a role of vaccines, there are still outbreaks and surge in many places around the world. So I guess maybe what is the most effective way of, of convincing people to, to, you know, to get vaccinated? Well, I, I can maybe ask one of my colleagues to answer that one as well. Um, Raul, did you have a thought on what was maybe most effective that you could see? And but just before you, because you're on, you're off camera, just I can, uh, what I can say is it's really specific to the country you're in. And so you really have to do this observation. We, we have something called the Vaccine um, Demand Observatory, where we really do social scanning of social listening. Every country has a small team that's looking at what messages are coming out in the local languages. What is it that's 
bothering people in this situation, what can we do to help support that? Um, but Raul, you might have a, a thought on that. It's a really good question. Oh, uh, yes, Liz, I think, uh, I think, I mean, very simple answer is uh, vaccine is the best solution. And, uh, and while we roll out vaccine, social vaccination is what we have to do. So I think uh, uh, as the kind of pandemic is spreading, more research is, is happening, but and maybe we have uh, uh, new solutions coming out. But as of now, we know vaccination and social vaccinations are the, are, the, are the best solutions. And that's something what we are repeating again and again and making sure people understand that uh, this is the best solution. And this is where we've talked about before where like, uh, you can they can contact the, the UNICEF local offices to help them with that messaging that they want to get out through whatever channel. So you the, and that local office would have that that sentiment that that data for the right messaging to reach those people in that local market. Is that correct? It is, and we can also add that we're seeing governments take a lot of action here because they're, it's their healthcare systems that are, are are struggling. It's it's they want to make sure people stay healthy. So we are seeing governments encouraging stronger and stronger, whether that's sort of a mandate for certain countries. I mean, you, you'll see it in the news. Um, so I think we're not alone uh, as in hoping that people, that we can stop this pandemic and, and governments are getting behind. How do we make sure people are, are vaccinated? And that's, of course, the decision of, of that country, um, how they do that. Well, Liz is back. Um, Liz O is back. So Liz, do you, do you have a question for the, the panelists that you would like to ask? Oh, you're on mute. No, I'd just like to add that, um, you know, thank you so much to the UNICEF team. Um, part of my objective today was to share some of the, the great work that you, you know, have educated me on. I knew on some level it was going to be a big logistical um, challenge to get go from, as you say, vaccines to vaccinations in arms in the most remote locations of the world. And um, the PATA network of all networks would appreciate this most because the depth and the breadth of our network in travel and tourism is so vast. And you know, we can appreciate this at the grassroots level, what it takes. And, um, and, you know, one thing I am conscious of, and when I spoke with the UNICEF team, I said, you know, a lot of my audience with PATA is going to be impacted economically. So they may not be the first companies who can actually write checks and donate. But as you can see, education and advocacy is, is one way you can help. There are many, many ways um, that we can address this and make sure that, you know, when you do see um, suspect information, that you point your friends, colleagues, to trusted sources and um, that, and also encouraging, you know, there are many ways the travel industry has infrastructure that has supported the pandemic um, solution in terms of, you know, whether it's conversion to field hospitals or vaccination centers, you know, I've seen amazing um, videos of tour buses converted to uh, mobile vaccine units. Um, but there are many, many ways without writing a check that actually this network can support. And all of you do have business associates. And so I know that whenever I talk to a multinational that I know is thriving, I ask them, is your company supporting vaccine equity? And so um, leverage your networks, communicate, you know, um, help us in communicating um, trusted information. And, you know, when you can find donors, you know, let's do that. I think, you know, I'm sitting here in Singapore and we're at a vaccination rate of 78%. And I well appreciate that that's a very privileged position. Most countries in this region are far, far behind that. And what we know is that, you know, governments in making their own policy decisions on weighing safety and security in the countries, they are looking for that benchmark um, in order to open up travel, open up um, uh, border restrictions. And so, you know, to think that it's separate is, is, you know, it's not, it's actually integrally wed to the, the health of society, but the health of our industry as well. And so I think that's an important thing to know. And the other aspect too, is there are people, you know, I think Mario pointed out that in Asia, there is greater vac vaccine acceptance. I've heard many cases of people having access to vaccines and, and being concerned. Um, and, you know, some of them even, you know, they wet it so closely to travel, their thought is, well, I'm not getting on a plane, I don't need a vaccine. Well, source and destination markets, 
in order to protect the community, you need to get, you know, they need to get vaccinated um, regardless of whether they need to fly or not, you know, to keep you and your community safe. And so, you know, I think there are, um, you know, as we know, this is a complex um, pandemic to solve, um, but it does require an all out effort. And I'm confident there are ways that we as a, as a network can help influence a faster, better outcome. So thank you to the UNICEF team. And um, Paul, did we have any other questions coming up? Nope, I think we're done. I think uh, we'll leave it at, at Liz's, Liz O's final words. Um, thank you so much, Liz, Shweta and Rahul. Um, you know, before, so just thank you so much, you know, as, as they said, you know, go out, get vaccinated, help in the efforts to advocate and getting, you know, getting people vaccinated. And if you need any help, uh, like to reach, you know, anybody from UNICEF, we're happy to connect you to, to local office to help you get that message out through your various networks as well. So before I do some closing, there is one final video from UNICEF that we would like to play. So I'll ask all the, all the speakers right now to turn the cameras off and I'll ask my colleague to play the last video. Um. Thank you very much, Liz and Shweta uh, and Raul, who's off camera. And uh, and I will just do a quick, uh, you guys have any last words or you want me to wrap up? Or I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity and thank you for just being part of, I think, a, a real unity. Like it feels so great to think that we can be working with Pata together, it really helps every day when we're out doing the things we're doing to know that we're working with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, th well and thank you. Thank you to Liz, Shweta, Rahul, and thank you to everyone at, at UNICEF and part of the COVAX initiative. I mean, you guys are, it's, it's, it's probably the, one of the biggest challenges we'll ever feel, we'll ever see in our lifetime. So, you know, I know you guys are all working around the clock and, you know, it's, it, it's great, to, you know, to, to hear the work you're doing. And, you know, I know that, I and everybody else really appreciates it. And, and so thank you to, to you and everyone at your team, everybody working around the clock around the world. So thank you so much. And, and I'll just do a quick uh, wrap up here. So let me, you guys can uh, all turn off your cameras while I just do a, a quick wrap up and, uh, and close out this webinar. So once again, thank you to, to Raul, Liz and Shweta. And of course, thank you to Liz for giving us a, uh, uh, the opening eight point strategy for from Pada. Um, I just want to make if you enjoyed this webinar, please do keep out for um, other webinars in the future. Next week we have uh, a Pada workshop. This is Pitch Perfect Market Your Business Concept. This is with the founder of Sigmund, Alan Elliott Mershon, and the director of Sigmund, Ali Stoltz Briola. Um, this is for Pada members and youth members only. Um, so if you're a member and a youth, you can join. If you're not a member, uh, please do, do, do join us. You know, we do have a lot of great content that, uh, that is only exclusive part of members. So it's, it's, you know, it's a good time to join now. We have a lot of great new initiatives coming up. We also have next week, we'll be uh, having our virtual part of travel marks. And again, part of members do have the ability to get a free booth, uh, sorry, complimentary booth. So, you know, these, these are some of the benefits of becoming a part of member. If you're not, if, you know, if you know somebody that's not, you can probably tell them about the, you know, all the great things that we're doing. Uh, if you have any questions about today's webinar, 
Uh, if you want to connect with, if you want us to connect you with uh, people at UNICEF, we're happy to do that. You can contact me. My email is paul at pata.org. If you want to find out more about anything about Pata that we're doing our upcoming webinars, always feel free to uh, to visit our website. Uh, sign up to our newsletter if you're not getting us. Let us know if you're not getting our newsletter. If you didn't get the the member only message from from Liz that she had talked about earlier, uh, sign you know sign up to our newsletter. Follow us on Facebook or, or any of our social media channels to stay updated to a lot of things that we're doing and our work uh, across the, the eight point strategy guide. And with that, thank you once again to all our guest speakers. Thank you, of course, to all of our members and our life members and our partners. Without your continued support, none of this would be possible. And thank you all of you for joining us today. Please do, you know, stay safe, get vaccinated, you know, continue to social distance, wear your mask, wash your hands. As I said, this is both offensive and defensive. As Liz had said, this is both offensive defenses. So everyone needs to do our part, um, you know, so that we can get to some kind of normalcy and, and you know, start uh, living and, and living a normal life again and traveling as we normally do. So once again, thank you so much. And I will hopefully see you next week at our next webinar. Take care, stay safe, take care.